then when he married Sharon Reimer, she had two girls, so he had seven. Three seventy five. Three seventy five. Three seventy five. Heaven holds all to me. Give it a second here. Michael, you gonna open us with prayer this morning? All right. Thank you, sir. Three seventy five in the little book. Heaven holds all to me. 
Earth holds no treasures but perish with using, however precious they be. Yet there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure. to Romans chapter 15, Romans 15. So as we looked last week, last couple weeks, the first part of Romans 14 reminds us of the truth that no one in the church is, quote, anybody else's master. This doesn't mean the church is a place of anarchy. It just means <clears throat> I'm not your high overlord and you're not my high overlord. One of the big challenges that we have in the church, right, goes back to Matthew 7 with Jesus. And that is that if we have a forest in our own eye, we're worried about a piece of sawdust in someone else's eye, and we'll nitpick someone else's piece of sawdust, but ignore the fact that we've got an entire forest of our own sin. And so that's the point of the first part of Romans 14. Then the second part was very specific, and, and as we said before, you need to leave it in its context about food and drink. We talked about the fact that when God originally made everything, he originally made it so that everything was able to live on a vegetarian, vegan diet. Then after the flood, God gave mankind permission to eat basically anything. And then for the Jews, well, for the Hebrews, the nation of Israel, he limited it down to only clean foods for very specific reasons. And so 
this simple truth about how people eat has not changed. You have some people in the world that are what? Vegetarian, vegan. About two billion of them. Right? You have about a billion and a half people that pork is off the menu. And then you have the rest of the world that's like, you know, if it's on my plate and it tastes good, I'm for it. And do people have strife with each other over food and drink even now today? I mean, in America, we're crazy. Right? You know, oh, you shouldn't drink that soda. It's bad for you. Okay. Okay. Well, you shouldn't drink your tap water. It's bad for you. Someone else, you know, that glass of wine, brother, it's, it's going to send you to hell. But they drink 12 Dr. Peppers a day and they're sugar junkies killing themselves with diabetes. And so what? This food drink thing continues. And so what he specifically talked about in that last section is, if you know your brother or sister has a problem with it, don't do it. Why? Because you're supposed to be the strong one. If you don't really care what you eat or drink, because your conscience is fine because you know what the Word of God says on it, don't make someone else who doesn't have that clarity have an issue with it. Now, in your own home, what? If you want to eat a hamburger that you basted in bacon grease... <laughs> that you cooked, that you put bacon on, that you layered some ham on, and uh, did you like goat cheese, and you seasoned your goat cheese by soaking it in wine before you melted it on your hamburger, have at it. Why, well, it doesn't matter. But when you invite someone over to your house that's vegan, that only likes green vegetables and non-chlorinated water serve that to them why what difference does it make to you and if we could take ownership of that as we move into chapter 15 that there is a realm of stuff where the word of God overall is very broad but if you know what the full scope of God's revealed word on a topic is, you should be able to adjust up or down, right or left, so that you can move forward, that's the key, so that you can move forward working in the kingdom with your brother and sister. And that's the point. And that's why he says to us, whatever is not from faith is sin in 1423. And Ronnie, what was it? You, you asked me a question after, after the class. Do you remember what your question was on that? None, but I figured you would. <laughs> uh, it was something along the lines of, and Ronnie gave me something specific, but that if he had an issue in his conscience with it, but because he came over to my house and he didn't want to be thought rude, he went on ahead and ate or drank in violation of his conscience. For him, would it be sin? And the answer to that is yes. Yes. And we're going to see, because in what we're fixing to look at, and we'll, we'll just assume that he only likes tap water and non-pork products. For that example. And I didn't know that he, he wouldn't eat pork. And he gets there and he's like, well, you know, my mama told me not to be rude. I should eat what's in front of me. But maybe he's not been convicted on that, like Paul said. Whatever's put in front of you, don't ask questions. Just eat it and give thanks to God. Maybe he hasn't studied that. And so he goes, well, I'll eat this pork and I'll apologize to mama when I get home, you know, for eating pork. You know. So he eats it. Now he's in sin. 
Why? He violated his conscience. It wasn't from faith. He didn't have God's word on it. He did something that he honestly believed is wrong according to his conscience. Maybe, maybe his name was uh, Rahman al-Abdul-Jabbar before he got converted. Now he's Ronnie Keller. So he grew up Muslim not eating pork. He hasn't studied what scripture says that what you eat really ain't that big a deal. But on the flip side of that, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll, the reason I ain't that pork is not cooked in you. Right. No. That's not. No. Well, I can see if you can take that to other realms too. And, and that's why Paul faith. says to us, whatever's not of faith is sin, because the moment, and here's why we're tying into this before we launch into 15. The moment I make not offending someone else in order to be socially polite when I don't have the word of God with me, is that you will be compelled in a whole realm to compromise your internal moral e ethics and integrity in the name of being polite and not being offensive. And once that thing goes, guess what happens? You've lost all your mooring for your soul. It never stops. You know. And, uh, so the only thing you can do in a, in a case like that is just yeah, you'd be as polite and you say, man, I am so sorry. When you invited me over for dinner, I should have let you know for how I was raised. I don't eat this. I will happily, though, spend our time together in fellowship. I will drink water with you, and I will enjoy it. And I'll even have another help of pork and beans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because you don't. And, and if I'm a strong brother, what would I? Well, hold on. What will you eat? Yeah. But you know, I'll, I'll go on ahead and eat this. What can I? What What do I have that you will eat? And if all I got is some sliced roast beef in the fridge, brother, I'll throw it on a piece of bread for you. Yeah. Why? Because of what we're fixing to see, right? So fifteen, one through six. We then who are strong ought to bear. With the scruples, okay, I don't particularly care for the word scruples, but um, we then who are strong ought to bear with the infirmities of the weak. And the reason I, I don't like that is remember back in Romans 8, 26. First of all, anybody in here, define the word scruples for me. See, that's my point. Scruples was always a bad word to use there. Because it's, how many of you have, of your own free will, prior to this morning, used scruples in conversation in the last 12 months? Okay. That's, that's you know. Okay, so my wife has. Do what? What, what Ann said? That it sounds kind of underhanded. Scruples, you know. Uh-uh. That's my point. It's a bad word to translate. Yeah, give me the actual definition. A feeling of doubt or hesitation with regard to the morality or propriety of a force or action. A feeling of doubt. Or hesitation. Or hesitation. With regard. With regard. To the morality. To the morality. Or propriety. Or propriety. Of a course of action. Of a course of action. <laughs> there you go. Let's go back to infirmities. Yeah, infirmities or weaknesses because, and here's why this is important. Romans 8.26, remember what he, the Holy Spirit told the Apostle Paul. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our infirmities, helps us in our weaknesses. Now, why am I connecting that back? If God, who is strong, has indwelt us with his Holy Spirit, who helps us in our weaknesses, how can we, who've received such help, 
not help our brothers and sisters in their weaknesses. Because, point of fact, are we all uh, encumbered with weaknesses or infirmities in one form or another? And so if the Holy Spirit helps us, the least we can do is to bear with the weaknesses or infirmities of our brothers and sisters and not to please ourselves Romans 15 1 and not to please ourselves verse 2 let each of us please our neighbor for good Leave out the word his. It's in italics. It didn't need the pronoun. Let each of us please our neighbor or his neighbor for good. Now here's what he's defining as good. That which leads to edification. For Christ, for even Christ did not please himself. So right there in three verses. Not to please ourselves. To please our neighbor, meaning our brothers and sisters within this context, even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Now that prophecy from Psalms right there. Uh, the reproaches of those who reproached you. Who's the you there? Mm -mm. the father the reproaches of those who reproached the father fell on Jesus. me Jesus that's how that prophecy plays out and so as we look at these first three verses right out of the gate Jesus pleased the father and in pleasing the father what instantly happened he edified or he blessed his neighbor. When we talk about this, and, and remember we've talked about what's the purpose of commands? What's the purpose of commands? Does God just like giving us rules so he can slap us down when we don't keep all of them? Now, how many of us were kind of taught that? God gives us rules so he can slap us down when we're naughty, right? Now, I'm going to use an example. I'm not going to use a military one. We'll use one that everybody can understand. How many of you ever watch Florida Gator football in any form? Have at least a couple of you watched that? Okay. So what if the only guy on the team who's seeking to please his teammates and his coach is the center? That the tackles and the guards walk out, and they look at the tight end, and they look at the receivers, and they say, you know what, we should just switch it up because it'd be fun. I've always wanted to play wide receiver and not tackle. And you know, if we're buddies, you should hook me up, man. And so for the next series of downs, the tackles are playing wide receiver, the guards are playing the end, and and your wide receivers and your tight ends are playing the guards and the tackles. The only guy who's where he's supposed to be is the center. The quarterback, he decided to make the halfback the quarterback, and he decided to just play the corner. And so when someone finally calls for the snap, what will happen to the new guards and tackles when they're hit by the real linebackers of the defense that is doing their part. Swoosh. Swoosh. Well, I think sometimes they play that way. 
Okay. You see, the day we get it through our heads, each of us has a part or a role to fulfill. And us faithfully fulfilling our role is the best way that we can help each other. That when we do our part, it enables other people to do their part. <clears throat> because it just... <clears throat> And John Madden was the one who started it, and other people try and do it, and none of them do it as good as John Madden. But John Madden says, see this guy here, he pulled back here, and that opened up for this guy here to shoot straight in, and that's why Troy Aikman now has his 19th concussion. For those who were Miami fans briefly, what was the number one reason the Miami never got their Super Bowl? The offensive line let Dan Marino get hit way too often and way too hard. Because Dan Marino is one of the greatest quarterbacks ever to play the game. And the only Super Bowl they went to under him against the 49ers, you say, man, I was a Miami fan from that big. Loved my Miami Dolphins. You say, no, I hate the Denver Broncos. I hated them as a kid. I hate them now. <laughs> Oakland Raiders, Pittsburgh Steelers, and Miami Dolphins. Those are my three football teams. And it broke my heart for Dan Marino not to get his Super Bowl ring. But why? He couldn't complete passes. He stayed <clears throat> scrambling basically the entire Super Bowl. And the number of times he got hit that he couldn't ever connect with his receivers because they never put a good solid line in front of him for him to do his job the way he needed to. When you read the word edification, I would encourage you, you doing your part so that other people can do their part so that the whole thing advances towards the end goal. For those who are fans of Civil War history, the number one thing that all historians agree on about the Battle of Gettysburg had Pickett done what he was told by Robert E. Lee when he was told to, Gettysburg would have gone the exact opposite direction. Wow. But Pickett didn't like Robert E. Lee, and he didn't think what Robert E. Lee said was important, so he lounged with his men until the battle was already turning against them. And by the time he launched, he launched wrong, he launched at the wrong place, and it ended up in a slaughter. Because one guy, one guy, thought he didn't need to do what he was told. And you say, is military history filled with stuff like that? You know? <clears throat> and so is football. How many things? And so, when you look at Jesus, did Jesus at times have a desire within himself to do something other than what was the core of the mission? What do you say, Brother Tommy? All right, I got to vote for no. Okay. And this, and this is where I know where Tommy's no comes from and where I know where the yeses come from. When Jesus said, oh, how I'd like to go on ahead and torch this entire place. And by the way, the fire's already started. Translation, I'm ready to be done with this because y'all brought me to that breaking point. But what? He didn't have the word from the Father to do it. So he didn't. Because he didn't do what pleased him, he did what pleased the Father. And, and yeah, in the garden, did Jesus want to go to the cross? He sweats, drops of blood, the Father sends angels to comfort him. Why did he need angels to comfort him? 
because his best friends were sleeping. They couldn't be bothered to stay awake to comfort him. He has to have angels. And he says what? Not, not what I want, but what you want. And then remember, he had another chance. He had another chance. Remember what he said to Peter. He said, Peter, good job. You whacked off Malchus' ear. Go on ahead. All you boys, attack. He said, no, brother, Jesus didn't say that. He asked Peter to put his sword back. And he says what? Right now, I can ask my father for 12 legions of angels so that I don't have to go through this. Now, let that one sink in for a moment. He's just come down from saying, not what I will, but what you will. But the door was still open that the father would have given him, would have given him, would have given him 12 legions of angels to destroy the world and him not to have to go to the cross. Translation, it was still there in Jesus' mind. He didn't have to do it. He chose to every step of the way, literally, literally. And that makes the sacrifice even more precious. It does. It does. Now let's go back and read Romans 15, 1 through 3 again. Jenny, since I never get to call on you, because you, you, you live in another state, would you be willing to read Romans 15, 1 through 3? Absolutely. Thank you. Mine's a little different version. That's fine. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his, his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. All right. Now take what we just said about Jesus and being pleasing and now transfer that back to us. <clears throat> might have been last week, might have been the week before last, but Brother Tom pointed out to us what the number one challenge we have in the church is our own egos. Our own egos. But this right here, these three verses say what? Move your ego out of the way. Move your ego out of the way. And now then we launch into verse 4. Now verse 4 is fine to quote standalone. But verse 4, well verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5, they're fine to quote standalone, but they're also really good to make sure you understand their context. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. So he's just quoted a prophecy that's about a thousand years old. And he said, what was written before was written for our learning. So the example of Christ that's in front of them, that's basically present tense, is tied to something a long time ago. And the lesson that was spoken back then, that was modeled in Jesus, is beneficial for us now. For what purpose? That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. The scriptures can give you patience. The scriptures can give you comfort. If, if, if. So how many ifs? Just three. If you will learn from them. If you'll learn. And I want to get into the some of the theological ramifications. But before Van Gogh or Van Gogh wanted to be a painter, artist, who knows what he actually wanted to be, and he was turned away. A 
priest. He wanted to minister the gospel and baptism in the Lord's Supper to people. They turned him away. Joseph Stalin wanted to be an Orthodox priest. They turned him away. Before he was not admitted to art school because he was mediocre. And before he got a bunch of drunk guys to back him in a political party in his first coup that later went on to lead to World War II, who knows what Hitler originally wanted to do. He wanted to be a priest. He wanted to minister the word of God, baptism, and the Lord's Supper, and pray with people. John Wesley, he was an Anglican all his life. He wasn't a Methodist. He was an Anglican. The Anglican church had no use for John Wesley, so when he finished seminary, his bishop said, the whole world's your parish. Go. And almost no other vicars in the Church of England would let him in their pulpits. He got chased out of Fields, guys would turn their bulls loose on him. Nobody would go to the miners in the mines in Wales. John Wesley would go and stand there for hours in between each shift change to preach the gospel to the miners coming out because the rest of the ministers of the Church of England wouldn't go to the poor people who worked in the mines. And, what, and you said... Because most people don't realize the original movement of Wesleyans in America were a cappella, and they all practiced baptism by full immersion. Because John Wesley and Charles Wesley believed that the only worship that was acceptable to God was a heart and a body yielded by the Holy Spirit to God through voice. Charles Wesley John's brother wrote over 10,000 hymns in his lifetime. And John Wesley, he, I, I don't know how many hundreds he wrote. Adam Clark, John Wesley's, uh, John Wesley comes on this guy, he's meditating on his Bible. And John Wesley says, hey, you know what you're studying? You know this? And he says, well, I hereby ordain you, go preach the gospel. And Adam Clark goes and preaches the gospel. And Adam Clark's commentary on Ephesians 5, in his commentary, is here was John Wesley's stance. John Wesley said, I have nothing against instrumental music in the church, as long as it's neither seen nor heard. That was how a cappella the original Wesleyans were. And you say, but... Don't ever confuse what people did later on with what some of those original people tried to do. The original Presbyterians in Scotland and Ireland were all a cappella favored. That's what they all wanted. So when you study the history of the Campbells and people that were Presbyterians in this country, that left the Presbyterian Church. The foundations for a lot of this were rooted in their education that was rooted in ancient church history. You say, what does that have to do? If you're not going to learn certain lessons from the scripture, don't ever expect to get patience or comfort. If you know that you're supposed to preach the gospel and you decide to do something else, what book, what book in the Old Testament would say to you, dumb idea? No. Jonah. Jonah's a pretty good one. Yeah. Because what? You're going to preach one way or another. He will get you somewhere where you have no choice but to preach. Or he will make life so uncomfortable till you decide, fine, I'll do it. That's Jonah's. 
Who's one of the other great people that did not want to minister the word of God to his people? Moses. Moses. And I love how <laughs> modern theologians are like, Moses had a stuttering problem and that's why he didn't want to preach and he was trying to get God to understand he was a stutterer. Seriously? How many of you used to know how to speak Spanish? Yeah, I used to be fluent in it. After enough years of not speaking it, I really hate to use it unless I absolutely have to. Because I know it hurts everybody who speaks Spanish's ears. <laughs> you know? Because why? Who realizes that after 40 years of being in the desert with sheep and speaking the language of the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, Moses didn't speak Egyptian like he used to. He'd been speaking a different language for 40 years. So when he says to God, look, man, I'm the wrong guy to send back. I am not eloquent in speech. Try and pick up a language you haven't used in 40 years. You're not going to be smooth. And he says, fine, Aaron will be your prophet, and to the nation of Israel, you'll be their God, and I'm your God. What finally persuaded Moses to preach and do the mission? It's all right. This is not a trick question, but it's not an obvious question to answer either. either. Remember, he put his hand in, his hand came out shining bright, right? And the Lord said, you've got a stick in your hand, I'm going to do powerful works through that stick you've got. But first, throw the stick down, turn it in into a snake and then pick it back up. And it was a poisonous snake that it turned into. And Moses did that. Moses was still like, no, I don't think I need to be the guy. <laughs> and then the scripture tells us, and the Lord became very wroth. Now I like the old King James on that. Because wroth means visibly, violently mad. You say, what did the Lord do? I don't know. I don't know if Moses, right there next to that bush, if that bush like flamed up and a 900 foot pillar of fire shot up and the mountain shook and the ground just about went out from under Moses. I don't know. But the Lord did something that as soon as the Lord became visibly wroth, Moses says, yes, sir, I'm going. <laughs> now you say, what's the lesson there for us? What do you know that you need to have been doing, you should have been doing, or you had been doing, but you quit doing because someone else jacked you up? Someone strong jacked you up. Someone weak jacked you up. And you quit being obedient to God where you know you should be. Get back on track because you're here to please the Father and the moment you please the Father, you please your neighbor. And in that moment, because when the word of God backs you up on your course of action, and you know you're right with God, you know you're right with his word, then in that moment, you're one of the freest people walking anywhere on the planet. Because if you're right with God and you're right with his word, you say, but brother, what if the whole world's against me? Yeah, his name was Jesus. How many people did Jesus hook up with miracles that do you honestly think there wasn't some miracle receivers there in the crowd chanting crucify him? How many when he refused to make lunch the second day turned away and never followed him again? John 666 says so. And from that time forward, many of his disciples turned back and followed him no more. Why? Because he wouldn't make lunch. And I, I, I bring these out because don't ever confuse you being pleasing with people liking you.
Is it possible that you can do something that's right according to the word of God that your brothers and sisters in Christ might be mad at you and hate you for? Yeah. And some people go, brother, you weren't very pleasing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the things were written for time written for my learning. And if I know that I'm on the right side of God... If you weren't cool with it, it's because you're on the wrong side of this. Because remember what we've said, the important question isn't, is God on your side or my side? The important question is what? Am I on the Lord's side? Am I on the Lord's side? You say, well, if I'm on the Lord's side, that means the Lord's on my side. No, it don't. Does the Lord... It, is there any variableness or shadow of turning with the Lord? No. no. So if we're on his side, we're instantly on the right side. And we're not right in and of ourselves, but we are right because we're on the right side and doing those things that please him. And in that moment, now we have patience and comfort. You say, but what if they all hate me? What if they... Run me out of town. What if they kill me? Well, first of all, you're going to die anyways at some point. Number one. Number two, what did they do to the majority of the prophets in the Old Testament? Killed them, stoned them. They made their life miserable. But what did Jesus say to us in the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are you if, because they did it to the prophets that were before you. Catherine got me watching a show <clears throat> about a Church of England vicar. And if you... It, <clears throat> so when I say this, I'm not endorsing the Anglican Church. But a group of Muslims needed a place to teach their children to pray and have Islamic classes. And so this vicar lets them in to use his church building. Now some of you go, no, no, just no. But it was a funny point. He said they're comfortable with their religion. He said because it's in every aspect of their life. He said Islam defines everything that they are as a person. He said we don't have that in the Church of England. And he, the whole episode's built around him questioning why he lacks power, why the church lacks power. I said, oh yeah, no. When our only goal is to please the Lord, and when the church takes up the banner that as long as it's right according to his word, this is what we're going to do. At that moment, will there be a clear line between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil? And at that moment, does there become a clear beacon of light going out from his church into the world of darkness? And so when we ask the question, how can we get along with others better, before we ask the question, how can I be pleasing to him? We started from the wrong point. Because the moment we're pleasing to him, you say, but that's going to upset some people. It upset them enough that they killed our Lord for it. So the moment we make that transition, but here's the other side of it. How many ships can be guided by a lighthouse that doesn't have its light on? No. So until we become that light, that beacon... To please him, how can we please our neighbor, and how can we build his kingdom?
Oh, <laughs> 